Welcome back, everyone. Let's begin our second semester of the school year in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please open your hymnals to page 240, where we will use the prime devotion this morning. And join me in the responsive reading. Hasten to save me, O God. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. We pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the rest of the past night and for the gift of a new day with its opportunities for pleasing you. Grant that we may pass its hours in the freedom of your service and, when evening comes, give you thanks again. Amen. Our hymn this morning, we will sing uh, hymn 316, verses 1 and 5. 1 and 5. Now I think we got it. There are some people in history who are identified by things they accomplished. That, his, that history has awarded these people with a corresponding name. Sometimes the accomplishment is so important that history has attached the great after their name. For example, who can tell me who this is? Alexander the Great, very good. All right, how about another one? This one might be a little harder. He's a famous Russian king or czar. This would be Peter the Great. Now how about this one? This is a famous emperor, Holy Roman Emperor. Sometimes if you use the Latin words, it's Charlemagne, which means Charles the Great. Next, how about a couple more modern figures that use different descriptors? Who's this guy? I heard it, Buffalo Bill. All right, there you go, Honest, Honest Abe. The theme of our devotions this short week is the sacrament of baptism. Fittingly, one of the focuses of our scripture reading today is someone whose name is synonymous with this sacrament, John the Baptist. I will focus on John's role as the forerunner of Christ, the promised Messiah, how baptism was an important result of John's calling, how John proclaimed Jesus as the promised Messiah, and how John's baptism of Jesus is a beautiful picture for us of the beginning of Jesus's ministry of reconciliation and proves God's acceptance of Jesus's work. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Mark. In this portion of scripture, 
the writer tells us some detail about John the Baptist. We learn what he was like, what his purpose was, and what his impact was. Please follow along on the screen as I read Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The moniker attached to John's name can be misleading. John the Baptist logically makes one think that John's job and main focus was baptizing. While John certainly was prolific in performing baptisms, that was only a portion of the work he was sent to do. Who sent John? God did, of course. John's appearance and purpose had been prophesied 800 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah and 400 years earlier by the prophet Malachi. Today's, today's reading from the book of Mark referenced those two prophecies with the words we just read in verses 2 and 3. Those two verses lay out the credentials of John the Baptist and simultaneously Jesus as well. Mark's reference to Old Testament prophecy is to make clear that his message was not some new religion, but rather it was the fulfillment of God's promises. God had promised a Messiah since the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. The promise had been repeated again and again, and now the time had fully come. As these prophecies foretold, this messenger, John, was the forerunner of Christ. The prophet Malachi had written that John was a messenger who will prepare the way. Messengers. They had a vast importance in ancient times. Even as little as 100 years ago, electronic messaging was non-existence or quite rudimentary. Whereas we might send an email, a text, make a phone call, messengers of old would deliver handwritten, or memorized verbal messages. It was super important that the messengers would relay the message exactly. No embellishments and no reductions. Why? Because a messenger was speaking for someone in higher authority, such as a king. Messengers sent by powerful people in ancient times were so important that it wouldn't be a stretch to say that a king was only as good as his messengers. Sometimes people are angered at the content of a message that they receive. Sometimes these people dislike the content of a message so much that they take their anger out on the messenger, even though the messenger is only doing his job. We have a saying for this today, don't shoot the messenger. This was to become a reality for John. To make clear, John's duty as a messenger, the gospel writer Mark described John's work using a Greek word commonly associated with a herald. Heralds were the official messengers of kings in ancient times. For example, in the last month we have frequently heard and sung the hymn titled, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, in which heavenly angels perfectly heralded to the shepherds a message of the birth of Jesus. God in his authority had sent the angels the angels were merely God's messengers. Similarly, God sent John to herald the coming Jesus. 
Mark also quoted the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, who also indicated that John would prepare the way for Jesus and further clarified the duties of the forerunner in that he would make straight paths for him, meaning Jesus. John's job was not to make the sacrifice of Jesus easier, but rather to prepare the audience for what was ahead. In what might be maybe an irreverent comparison, John was the warm-up band before the main show, preparing the audience by building their anticipation for the main attraction. In this case, an attraction anticipated for many centuries. But John, in his humility, claimed no glory for himself. How did the people know that it was John that was prophesied as the forerunner of Christ? The prophecies of Isaiah and Malachi supplied us with this answer as well. Isaiah declared it would be a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And Malachi 4 verse 5 tells us that God will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Clearly, the prophet from Malachi's prophecy could not be Elijah because he had been taken to heaven 800 years before John's ministry. Therefore, this must be a new prophet with qualities similar to Elijah's. The people well understood the famous prophet Elijah's message and his fashion sense. And John certainly fit the bill. Our reading for today tells us that John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. Quite similar to the description of Elijah in 2 Kings, which you can see on the screen. Furthermore, John's message of repentance and his criticisms of those in public positions of authority were also unmistakably similar to Elijah's. Clearly, the crowds that appeared before John were evidence of his effectiveness. His proclaiming of God's message was received positively by many, but angered important people in power. Eventually, after probably less than two years of his ministry, Herod Antipas essentially shot the messenger and he executed John. John's listeners sensed the power of God in his message. In fact, John was so effective at his calling that people wondered aloud if he was actually the Messiah. Recognizing that people were misidentifying him John made very clear in his words that he was not the Messiah. He proclaimed his sinful unworthiness by comparing himself to a slave, someone of the lowest rung of society's ladder. John felt unworthy to perform for Jesus even the most lowly of tasks, saying of Jesus, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. In spite of John's feelings of unworthiness to serve his important role, our Lord approached John one day with the intent of being baptized. Placing this event on the timeline of the Gospels, this was actually the first time we hear news of Jesus since he had been left behind in, the, in, the, left behind in Jerusalem as a boy. But John was reluctant to accept Jesus' request to be baptized. The Gospel of Mark does not tell us of John's reluctance to perform the baptism of his Savior. We learn of John's humble resistance from the Gospel of Matthew. John's reluctance to baptize Jesus was not sinfulness. It was actually a sign of John recognizing Jesus as God. John knew that the power of baptism does not lie in the performer of the sacrament because he had performed thousands of baptisms in spite of his own sinful condition. What caused John's reluctance was not only John's sinful condition, but that in combination with Jesus' sinless condition. Baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. And John rightly reasoned that the sinless Son of God had no need of forgiveness and therefore had no need to be baptized. Truly, did Jesus did not need to be baptized. However, the Gospel of Matthew tells us Jesus instructed John to the reasoning behind his request. Jesus said, 
Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Why did the sinless Jesus want to be baptized? Using the words of Jesus, the explanation is that it was proper to do so now. The baptism of Jesus visibly marked the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. What a marvelous way to begin the begin to sh- mark the beginning of Jesus' work. Just as each of us can point to our baptism as our spiritual birth, we can also point to the baptism of Jesus as the beginning of the fulfillment of the work that gives baptism its power, the forgiveness of sins, salvation, and eternal life in heaven. Jesus' baptism was a public sign that he had joined the ranks of sinners, walking side by side with us on our earthly journey, then taking up the cross to pay the price for our imperfection with his perfection, to fulfill all righteousness. It was also fitting that John would be the one to baptize Jesus. What better way to solidify for Christians of all time John's role as the forerunner? John's work pointed to Jesus as the one. He verbally and publicly preached Jesus as the Messiah. He admitted his own unworthiness before Jesus, and he baptized him publicly as the fulfillment of John's work a proverbial passing of the torch from the messenger to the fulfiller of the prophecies of old. Immediately, we learn of God's approval of Jesus being baptized. All four Gospels record this stunning event when all three persons of the Trinity were evident to those in attendance. The heavens were opened, and the voice of God the Father proclaimed that this man, Jesus, was truly his beloved Son, and that he was pleased with him. The Holy Spirit also participated and descended on Jesus like a dove. All three members of the Trinity giving affirmation to the efforts of God's Son, our Savior from sin. What a beautiful portrait has been painted for us in the Gospels of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. In your chapel devotion tomorrow, you will learn more about the details of the sacrament of baptism, and what it brings to those who are blessed with the gift of faith. Let's now turn back in our hymnals to page 241. And we will join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray that you will, would so guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now recite the Lord's Prayer. It can be found on the left-hand side, the contemporary version, left-hand side of page 224. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever.